I recently got the chance to play Star Wars Squadrons along with some of the other EA Game Changers. We played a small bit of the story, basically serving as a flight tutorial, a couple rounds of dogfights, and a couple rounds of fleet battles. Today I'll be giving you my initial impressions of everything we saw. In short, I thought it was awesome. I've always loved the Star Wars flight simulator games like X-Wing and TIE Fighter, the Rogue Squadron series, and Starfighter Assault was probably my favorite mode in Battlefront 2. I've seen people show concern that Squadrons is just going to be an expanded version of Starfighter Assault, and I'll tell you right now, it is not that. Squadrons is complex. I've been guessing this game would be easy to pick up but difficult to master, and I absolutely think that was the case for me. Like I said, I've been familiar with these games for years, so it was pretty easy for me to hop in the cockpit and find my bearings. Flying and shooting felt good and pretty much like I expected, but there are so many new variables to squadrons now. The power management system, adjusting your shields, building and utilizing boost, swapping out components to give yourself an edge, using countermeasures at the right time. A lot of that stuff can be ignored for first time pilots. You can just keep your shields, weapons, and engines balanced the whole time and focus on flying and shooting. But as you get more comfortable with power management, you can see a pretty dramatic difference in your survivability. Before playing, I was a little concerned with the first-person-only cockpit view. I tend to fly ships in third-person for extra visibility, so I was worried I would have a hard time following the action or seeing what was going on in general. That did not happen at all. Some ships definitely have it better than others. The A-Wing, for example, is wide open and probably my favorite ship to fly. But even the Ties, with their far more restrictive cockpits, didn't pose any issue. You have plenty of tools at your disposal to keep track of your enemies, either through the radar or by locking on. You can lock onto anything directly in front of you with the L trigger on an Xbox controller, that's what I was playing with, but you can also cycle through targets using the A button. Once something is locked on, the user interface will help you keep track of them. There's also a locking menu you can access to choose what kinds of targets you want to cycle through that I totally forgot to even use. Like I said, there are a lot of features in this game that are optional, but as we all get more comfortable, we'll probably wind up being very helpful. And it sounds like the best way to learn the game will be to play through the story mode. Everyone will have to play the prologue when they first start the game just to get the basics of flight. I won't get into any actual details to avoid spoilers, but it took about half an hour to complete and it gives you time in both a TIE Fighter and an X-Wing. By the time it's over, you should be ready to hop into dogfights and multiplayer, but the game developers confirmed that continuing on through the story will teach you more and more about the game. That's where you'll learn more advanced piloting moves like drifting. You'll also get time in the cockpits of other ships, which will be helpful, especially when it comes to the support craft. The fighters, bombers, and interceptors were all pretty straightforward, but I tried the Ewing and TIE Reaper and was kind of at a loss. I didn't know how to best support my teammates and could definitely use a tutorial lesson. I asked how long the story mode will take to complete and was basically told it varies, which is a non-answer. I'm still hoping for the length of a Call of Duty campaign in the 7 hour range or so, but they did say there are optional objectives we can chase in the story, there will also be a variety of missions outside of just dogfights and fleet battles. And finally, I thought that the cutscenes we got to see were well acted and looked great. There's also a practice range where you can continue honing your skills. You can set up obstacle courses or spawn in AI pilots, so that'll be helpful in really nailing down those more advanced moves. But I didn't spend a whole lot of time in there, so let's get into multiplayer. We started in dogfights, and the developers said that for now, players need to play a handful of dogfights before they can unlock fleet battles, and I would recommend that anyway. Fleet battles is a whole different beast, but we'll get to that soon. For dogfights, it's just a simple 5 vs 5 deathmatch. You choose your ship and load out, you fly in, fight until you die, and then you can change your ship or load out when you respawn. It's simple, there isn't a whole lot to worry about other than not crashing. And by the way, crashing is something I actually really liked in this game. I'm so used to clipping one little piece of debris and then completely exploding. Not in squadrons, you bounce off of debris or objects or whatever you hit. It can kill you, but you won't be overly punished for one minor bump. And even if you do take some damage, there are recharging health drops throughout the map to get fixed up. 
Although your cockpit can take damage like cracked glass that will not be fixed, which I thought was cool. We only got to play on one map, but it was well built with plenty of avenues for escape if you're fleeing an enemy or missile. The only downside I see for dogfights right now is that I don't really know why you would fly anything but a fighter or interceptor. That's your only objective, to kill other ships. Bombers and support aren't meant for that purpose, but I'm sure there are good reasons to use them and I think it'll all come down to good team communication. I should point out that we had mics on for these games, but nobody really knew who we were playing with, so people seemed hesitant to use them. Eckert's Ladder and I found out after the fact that we were flying together and against each other quite a bit, so if you ever see me destroying username Squadrons37, point and laugh, that's him. This footage I'm showing you is actually me going on a 16 kill streak. I go the whole match without dying. I'm gonna toot my own horn now, because that will probably never happen again. But I point out the communication thing only to say that I think playing with a team that communicates is going to be another dramatic shift in your performance, and that's going to be key, especially in fleet battles. So here's how that mode works. It's still five real players versus five other real players, but this time there are also AI starfighters in the mix. Each team also has a pair of cruisers and one capital ship. So the players meet in the middle and they dogfight. Each ship you destroy boosts the morale of your team. Destroying an actual player gets you more morale than destroying an AI. Once you have enough morale, you can go attack the cruisers. Once you blow up the cruisers, you can attack the capital ship. It sounds simple, but it turns into a real back and forth battle. Attacking anything larger than a starfighter is hard. That was probably the most common note people had when discussing the game afterwards, is that we would just get demolished by turbo lasers. I think we just got thrown into the deep end really fast and had no idea what we were doing. A lot of us, myself included, would just fly straight at our target and unload on it as much as we could before exploding. I kind of had it in the back of my mind that we were on a time limit, but you aren't. You need to be smart about your attacks because your death means a loss in morale for your team, and if you lose enough morale, then the enemy gets to attack you. But if you stay alive, you keep your morale up and you can make more attack runs. I think it becomes more about whittling these bigger ships down instead of one massive attack to wipe it out. Work together, cover each other, stay alive, and don't get greedy. This is really where the bombers come into play. They can dish out a lot of damage against the cruisers and capital ships, but they're slower, so they need protection. Communication would have been really helpful at this point, and I wish we had used the mics more. But you can still just pay attention to your team's composition. If you already have three A-wings, it's probably time to pick up a Y-wing or U-wing to balance things out. The fighters can also be adapted with their loadout to pack more punch against the larger ships. Oh, and if you don't have a microphone, there's a ping system that will allow someone to mark a target, and then you can acknowledge that ping, which will automatically lock onto it for you, so that's helpful. But again, we just weren't using that. Once you get to attacking the capital ships, you can go about it in a variety of ways. You can destroy their turbo lasers one by one, or you can take out their targeting systems, which will make them less effective overall. Or you can wipe out their shield generators to keep their shields from recharging, allowing you to dish out more damage to the hull. Or you can destroy the power system, which will open up vulnerabilities in the ship that'll deal out even more damage when hit. Those vulnerabilities can also be opened up by bombers. Again, we only played one map here, but it was also solid. There were lots of nooks and crannies to fly through to shake a tail. There's plenty of cover when you're approaching targets on your own. It was just a lot of fun to fly around. And the game felt balanced. I think I won half the matches I played, and we were all at pretty much the same skill level. And that reminds me that fleet battles will have a ranking system to keep players grouped by skill so you won't wind up being uh, completely outmatched so every alive. game. I think a lot of thought has gone into the balance of this game. I played around with some of the Y-Wing loadouts, and while it made my primary weapon insanely strong, it also slowed me down significantly. Everything has a payoff. Like I said before, this game does have a pretty steep learning curve, but I felt myself adapting to new skills pretty quickly, and I thought the controller layout, while complex, made sense. Some buttons do three things depending on whether you tap it, double tap it, or hold it, but it worked. If players are having trouble mastering everything, they can play fleet battles offline by themselves against AI or against AI cooperatively with friends. 
Jumping outside of gameplay, I wanted to touch on a few different things I noticed. There are a lot of customization options for your ship. Different paint jobs, emblems, or decorations, like the Ewok bobblehead. They said they only included a taste of the cosmetics in our build of the game, and that there would be more in the final version. But there were already a decent amount, and the paint jobs were great. Some were fun, like a rusted look, and some were in-universe, like Saw's Partisans, or more obvious choices like red, gold, green, or blue squadrons. There were references to things outside of the films as well, like Star Wars Rebels or even Legends. The Imperials have a 181st paint job. I also noticed that if you randomize your pilot's name, there are some fun easter eggs in there, like Key and Farlander from the original X-Wing game. But jumping into pilot customization, that was not as robust as I was hoping. It's basically just a collection of heads and body types you can choose from, but apparently not customize. There are different species on the New Republic side, and again, we didn't see every available option, just what they allowed in our build. But I was hoping I could straight up make Big Starklighter in this game. Oh well. Also not included in this build were VR or HOTAS support. I was hoping to try both, but they had us just play on controller or mouse and keyboard. The controller felt great, but I really do want to see how HOTAS handles. I've never tried it, so that'll probably only make my learning curve for this game worse, but the idea of being in VR playing with a joystick and thruster sounds incredible. Oh, and there is one game mechanic for turning where you will turn fastest at half thrust. It's kinda hard to know when you hit that sweet spot on a controller, but with HOTAS I could see that being an advantage. Also VR and the ability to look left and right or up outside of your cockpit, I could see that being helpful as well. But I could also see me getting distracted and crashing into everything. You can free look using a controller as well, but you have to double click the right stick to do so. For the future, I asked if we'd be seeing any more ships added to the game. They said there are no plans yet, but never say never. They wanted to deliver a complete experience upon release, but if the response to the game is good, they might update squadrons down the line with new content. But that's all I've got to say today. Star Wars Squadrons is a blast so far. I can't wait to play it again with people I don't mind yelling at over voice chat. I could see this becoming a very competitive game where ace pilots are separated by their abilities to handle their ships in a more nuanced way. Setting loadouts for appropriate situations, properly managing their power, and communicating with their teammates to coordinate attacks and team compositions. Let me know what you think of Squadrons in the comments, and check out videos from our friends Eckert's Ladder, Cubs Fan Han, and Cinematic Captures. I know they all got to play it as well. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and consider checking out our Patreon page. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.